This is Investing Ideas by ValueInvestAsia.com. Welcome to Investing Ideas. My name is Stanley. This week, we chat with one of our regular contributors here at Value Invest Asia, Ong Jun Pat. Jun Pat is an experienced investor and also a financial blogger himself. His specialty is actually in the Malaysian stock market. So that's why today he's sharing with us one of his favorite stock on Busa Malaysia, Carlsberg Brewery Malaysia. If you have been a member of our Value Invest Asia Club, you would have known that this is also a stock that I have owned for many years. However, I'll be the devil's advocate here and I'll be challenging Jun Pat on his ideas and test the strength of his thesis. So I hope you enjoy our discussion. Here we go. From ValueInvestAsia.com, this is Investing Ideas, where we talk to investors from all walks of life, learn from them, and find out some of their favorite investment ideas. Today, you're going to introduce one of your favorite uh, stock within Malaysia stock market, the Booster Malaysia as well. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce this company to our audience? All right. So, uh... When you approach me to come up with the new uh, investing ideas uh, episode, uh, I was like, hmm, since it's like Chinese New Year period season, so why don't we do something, so a company related to Chinese New Year, and uh, during Chinese New Year, we, we Chinese, we love to drink. <laughs> <laughs> so the lucky company that uh, I'll be introducing is um, Carlsberg Brewery, Malaysia Brahat. Ah, okay, okay. But why, why this company? Why don't you uh, share a little bit about about, about the company? So, uh, Carlsberg Brewery Malaysia is a is a brewery. Uh, they mainly uh, brew alcoholic beverages. They have a plant in uh, Malaysia in uh, Shalam, and then after brewing these products, they are also in charge of uh, marketing and selling these products. So, um, Carlsberg. Uh, as a brand, it's a famous and well-known brand. Uh, Malaysians and Singaporeans, uh, we all love our Carlsberg and sometimes uh, we also opt for Carlsberg's competitor, which is Heineken. But uh, all in all, uh, Carlsberg is a brand that since a small child, uh, we already we already know uh, this is a, a beer brand that uh, maybe our parents love, our relatives love, and uh, as we go older and once we pass the so-called legible age to drink alcohol. I mean, that's where we took up to actually like enjoy cows for <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what what's the business model like? Why why do you, why do you like it so much? Mm, basically, when we talk about cows, it's a it's a brewery business. Uh, it's considered a part of the uh, FMCG, the fast moving consumer goods. Uh, it's with particularly niche because it's really very really focused on uh, alcoholic beverages and uh, at home leisure uh, you can only find two listed brewery uh, companies one which is Carlsberg uh, Malaysia and the other one is Heineken Malaysia so what makes um, Carlsberg so special is that um, they really focus on alcohol and uh, alcohol as a product as its own, has its uh, specific loyal fan base. So uh, uh, you can say that it's quite recession to uh, any economic downturns. And uh, on top of buying uh, other consumer stocks like uh, FNN or, or Dutch Lady. Uh, so Carlsberg is like a special, it has a special place when it comes to comparing against uh, other food companies. But how, how do you see this company in terms of its growth? Or, um, you know, a lot of people, when, when we talk about Carlsberg, uh, it's a company that has been around for many, many years. And do you really feel that there's still growth in such a company? Well, I say yes, because um, when we look at the company financials, uh, mm. um, Carlsberg as a company has been growing even though uh, they are predominantly very, very focused in Malaysia and Singapore. Just because the simple fact that um, human population is always on the rise and um, every year you have a new batch of youngsters turning 18 or 21 now, it's a, the legal age is now 21. So everyone, once they pass the age 21, they will want to get the, 
get a taste of uh, what what beer is really tastes, tastes like. And uh, it's uh, when it comes to alcoholic beverages, it's a uh, social drink mainly when uh, after work when uh, you people with, with their colleagues or with their close pals when they hang out. Uh, usually, beer is one of the the uh, social drinks that uh, they would all gather around and have a drink and chit chat and catch up. So it has a, not only it, the product itself, but uh, how it really brings people together. So, yeah, I do see Carlsberg still growing, continue growing. Okay. Uh, and, and compared to, of course, when we talk about Carlsberg, we always talk about its main competitor, which is uh, Heineken Malaysia, la, previously yeah. known as uh, Guinness Anchor, perhaps. Um, what's the difference between the two, you know? Mm, actually, both of them are very similar. Uh, I would say the key differences would primarily be the brand. Uh, each have each of them have their strong brands. Uh, but one key difference, uh, Carlsberg really sets apart itself compared to Heineken is that uh, Carlsberg Malaysia, the plant in Malaysia, manufactures uh, alcoholic brew uh, beverages for Malaysia and also Singapore. Where else Heineken, they have two plants. Uh, one is also in. KL and the other one, uh, it's under the uh, Asia Pacific Breweries, uh, which is in uh, Singapore. So the the plant over in Malaysia only focuses uh, producing uh, alcoholic beverages for the Malaysian consumption. Where else, um, APB in Singapore uh, will be more focused on uh, Singapore consumption and also a bit of export, lah. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, Carlsberg Malaysia is actually more international compared to Heineken Malaysia. Yeah, and not to mention, they also have a small stick in uh, Sri Lanka uh, beer, beer factory, uh, right. which is called Lion Breweries. Yeah, so they ah. have a small stick there. So okay. that gives their, uh, I would say, secret cut that they can potentially turn the tide around when it comes to comparing against Heineken Malaysia. Right, okay. Uh, but wouldn't you say that it's kind of like a double-edged sword, if, if I may? Uh, because uh, Singapore is more or less a much more matured market compared to Malaysia and you've seen that in uh, maybe other developed markets of, of the trend of people once they become reach a point and become more affluent they switch from like mainstream uh, beer brands like Carlsberg and go into more niche uh, microbreweries type of brand we seen, we're seeing that happening in Singapore wouldn't that actually be a downside risk for Carlsberg Malaysia as a whole because they are exposed to the Singapore market, which is quite substantial within their business, right? Yes, it is. Um, uh, okay, uh, noted that um, when it comes to microbreweries company, craft beer, it is the uh, so-called up-and-coming trend. And uh, just in Singapore, where I have like hung out with my pals in a few places, craft beer actually is a big thing. Uh, mm. in Singapore. But surprisingly, for Carlsberg, they also have their own range of craft beer. So they have this special uh, a brand uh, called the Brooklyn Breweries, which uh, they categorize under a craft beer, as a craft mm. beer category. So they actually uh, contacted or uh, had that this Brooklyn Brewery is actually an American uh, microbrewery, which uh, Carlsberg actually uh, team up with them to actually produce craft beer at their existing site at uh, Malaysia. So not only uh, they produce like the uh, so-called uh, normal beers like Carlsberg, Asahi, but they also have uh, specialty craft beers under their portfolio as well, which is quite amazing. Uh. Do you see that also one of their main growth that they're going to use as in uh, increasing their just the, the, the brand portfolio uh, in the future? Oh yeah, when we look at the uh, 2018 latest um, annual report, they have been highlighting uh, a three-digit growth uh, for the Brooklyn Lager beer, the craft beer that uh, they actually uh, just brought over. And uh, that growth actually uh, speaks a lot that mm. uh, it can actually uh, satisfy or view the, view the uh, growth and appetite uh, for craft beers in Malaysia. So... Of course, craft beer uh, in Malaysia is a bit of a specialty because um, alcohol beverages is actually uh, taxed 
or they have a higher excise duty when imported uh, from other countries. So the benefit of uh, Carlsberg Malaysia having this Brooklyn Lager under their portfolio actually provides Malaysian a cheaper option to enjoy craft beer at a lower price point. Right. I'm looking at uh, some of their financial as well. It, it seems that they have been able to sustain their profit margin at a very, very stable rate uh, over the past decade. Uh, what's their secret? Mm, when we talk about um, beer or alcoholic beverages, um, just beer itself. Lah. Um, beer actually consists of four vital ingredients, mainly uh, barley, water, hops, and uh, yeast. So basically the process is where you mix everything together and then you introduce yeast inside to actually uh, ferment, the break down the sugars from the barley. And once the, the uh, so-called fermentation happens, you get alcohol. So um, of all these ingredients, barley is actually a commodity and barley prices actually fluctuate a lot up and down. But the surprising thing about um, Kalsuk Malaysia when you look at their profit margin, gross profit margin, is that they have been really, really consistent uh, over the past 10 years. It has been uh, above 30%. So it speaks volume on how they manage their raw material procurement. Uh, of course, they have in place uh, uh, experts when it comes to the raw material prices on where to buy more, how much more to cover. And uh, also, this all, all of this information also has to tie back to uh, what is their sales forecast so that they don't run into a situation where they, uh, they bought a bit lesser than what the sales growth is and uh, in the end, it impacts their growth margin. So I would say in the totality, when you look at how the business is run in terms of the gross profit margin uh, where they have consistently sustained at a 30% plus, uh, it's a really uh, a proof that everything has been run, the management has been running the company very, very well. Looking at their balance sheet, uh, what's your assessment on that? When we look at the balance sheet, the company has been really, really stable. Uh, of course, when we look at their latest balance sheet, uh, they have access of uh, $682 million and total liabilities is 500 million and the rest of the total equity is 180 uh, million. Mm -hmm. So at one glance of it, you see that how come uh, a company like Housework is having so much higher uh, liabilities compared to the equity. So when you look at the breakdown of the liabilities, uh, only a small part of it is its borrowings from the mm -hmm. banks. The rest of it actually is uh, payables. And when right. you also uh, try to uh, do a bit of calculation, you will actually find that uh, it's a cash. The cash cycle, con cash conversion cycle of household is very uh, magnificent. Basically, it is able to uh, delay payments to its uh, clients while also asking for a longer uh, paying 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 period from from its suppliers. So basically, they are getting free money to run the business. And hence, when you look at the ROE, uh, you get a above 100% ROE. So that is how a good business actually can run with their, can run its business without the money from a shareholder, but rather the money from other people's money. In this case, uh, there's money. La. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a, a very, very fascinating business model. Uh, yeah. They have also been one of the key dividend payer in on Busa Malaysia as well. Do you see that? going to continue or is there any risk to their dividend? Is it sustainable? Um, well, when it comes to dividends, uh, we have to also think, uh, tie back that dividends paying out from a company um, is cash. It's, 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 mm. it's a cash dividend. So before we look at uh, how sustainable the dividend paid out is going to be, we also have to take a look at the uh, so-called cash flow, free cash flow of the company. So when a company like Houseberg when they report profits, uh, it also has to tie back to the cash that they are receiving from the business. So, of course, the cash flow has been also very fantastic. It has been growing, uh, trending up positively without showing any potential signs of coming down. And mm. when we compare that with the dividends that they are paying up, almost 100% of their earnings 
they are paying it out as dividends to the shareholder. So it's like they, they will be consistent payout every time Carlsberg reports higher profits. So it's really <laughs> amazing like how this kind of company is actually available in Busan, Malaysia. I will say that this kind of company is almost just a handful on Busan, Malaysia, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, would, would, you, would you say it is mainly because they have uh, their shareholder structure uh, that they have a main shareholder, the Carlsberg AS, that's why they need to constantly be paying out the dividend to back to the parent company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, this kind of trend is particularly noticeable when we compare uh, companies like Carlsberg, Heineken, and also Nestle Malaysia. So what is special about these three companies is that they actually have a mother company, mother HQ, outside of Malaysia. Mm. So for mm. Nestle, it's, it's, it's listed in uh, the Swiss stock exchange under Nestle SA. Carlsberg, mm. uh, the mother company, is listed in the uh, Danish stock exchange and uh, Heineken is in the Euro stock exchange. Mm. So why these companies uh, actually... Con- so all these mother HQ companies are controlling uh, these uh, other, other, other listed companies around the world. Uh, as a majority shareholders, and they act like like an like like an investment company. So basically, their job is to invest in uh, profitable breweries all around the world. And once uh, companies like Carlsberg Malaysia under the investment of Carlsberg AS, once they have registered a profit, they have enough cash for collected from the sales. Automatically, a major sum of it if not all, will be repatriated back to the mother company. So, And these companies are also listed on their respective stock exchange and they also have to show that they are growing and they are also collecting more cash from the investments mm-hmm. all around the world. In that sense, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that uh, it almost doesn't really matter if I invest in, say, Carlsberg or Heineken, given that, uh, or, or even some of the other... Uh, MNC that has such a shareholder structure, given that m- most of them will all still be very high dividend and quite consistent in a sense, right? Mm. And maybe I give you a more specific example. At, at this juncture, right, at this stage, why would you choose Carlsberg uh, over, say, a company like uh, Nestle Malaysia or Dutch Lady Malaysia? Given that, you know, Malaysia, no matter what, is still... Uh, a, a Muslim majority country, and so uh, alcoholic bre- brewery will never be able to serve the entire population, right? But uh, a company like Nestle in Malaysia is actually here to serve the entire population, and wouldn't you say that that the growth potential would be much better? Um, yes, I would agree with you to say that in a way, uh, in that kind of perspective, definitely Nestle would be poised to encounter more growth uh, compared to a company like Carlsberg or Hub, which can only serve the non-Muslim uh, market around Malaysia. But um, but when we compare the valuation of Carlsberg Brewery against uh, Nestle Berhad, well, mm. Nestle Berhad, also with a very fantastic um, business model and brand, brand image of its product, um, we also see that it's kind of impossible for sales to suddenly lose steam or uh, something bad to happen to the company. But um, as we all are quite aware that the valuation of Nestle World Heart is quite at, quite a premium right now. It's at around 50 plus, uh, with, if I'm not, uh, not mistaken. And when we compare it against the uh, uh, HU Nestle SA uh, listed in the Swiss Stock Exchange, it's just around mm. 25 plus. So uh, Nestle Berhad itself is at two times more the premium of uh, Nestle SA. So when it comes to this kind of uh, justifications and comparison, uh, no doubt Nestle would be still growing, but uh, you would want to buy Nestle uh, at a better price to earnings ratio and a better valuation. Wow, okay. It's almost trading like a tech company. Yes, it did. <laughs> <Nestle. laughs> okay, just now you mentioned a little bit uh, on uh, the investment that Carlsberg Malaysia has, which is on Lion Brewery, yeah. uh, the main brewery in Sri Lanka. Hmm. Uh, what's that about? You want to share a little bit about that? Um, okay, so um, 
Lion Brewery is a uh, it's one of the oldest brewery in Sri Lanka, and currently majority it uh, it manufactures uh, beer for the Sri Lanka uh, market segment or the Sri Lanka population. So um, mm. we all know Sri Lanka as the a small island just beside India. Uh, but mm. surprising fact about Sri Lanka is although it's it's an island nation, uh, it has a population of uh, 21 million as of latest and. So we see that this uh, small stake in the Lion Brewery uh, by Coastal Malaysia could actually be the next uh, growth factor to actually uh, contribute more uh, in the future mm. towards uh, Coastal Malaysia's earnings. Right, and that's because the addressable market in Lion Brewery is actually much bigger than the addressable market that uh, Coastal Malaysia has actually has. Yep, yep, right? indeed. Mm. Cool. Okay. Uh, it seems that this company is almost perfect. Uh. <laughs> why? Why don't you share a little bit? What, uh, in your opinion, what what could go wrong with this company? What's the what What's the risk here? Mm, I think the special thing about uh, having a listed brewery uh, company in Malaysia is that uh, the regulation itself is considered a mode and a protection. So. Mm. Uh, Back in Malaysia, as as a as a playground uh, area, uh, counselor only needs to, you know, uh, compete with Heineken Malaysia for the Malaysia uh, market share of uh, beer drinking communities. And uh, mm. on top of that, they also have an uh, uh, a stake in the uh, Sri Lanka brewery. But um, what makes these two companies, especially Heineken and uh, Kaufland, so special is that the excise duty that the Malaysian uh, government actually tax upon uh, export alcohol really deters um, other big breweries around the Asian region from entering Malaysia because it just doesn't make any sense for them to uh, import their beer, get taxed at a higher duty and the end when the products enter to Malaysia from a point, price point of view it's uh, going to be much more expensive than uh, Carlsberg or Heineken Malaysia. So these big companies, uh, big breweries companies like uh, High Bev, uh, High Beverage, mm-hmm. uh, a listed uh, Thai uh, alcohol brew, brewery, uh, San Miguel, uh, Philippine Brewery, and also Qingdao, a Chinese-based uh, mm. brewery. So uh, over in Singapore, I, I we still see Thai Bev, uh, San Miguel, and Qingdao products uh, fairly uh, at certain certain areas, but the uh, Back in Malaysia, it's more stricter. Uh, you only mm. tend to see uh, Carlsberg or Heineken products in the supermarket or in uh, those short areas. Maybe as a disclosure, do you own this company? Uh, the very interesting thing is I, I don't own this company. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why I never uh, own this company. Yes, why? Um, you know, when, we come, when it comes to investing uh, particularly, we always like to have margin of safety. We always mm. like to say, oh, if the price correct down, mm. then um, probably I'll buy. Mm. But the thing about Kausberg Berhad, if you look at, at their historical uh, performance in terms of stock price in 2019, is that it started off the year in 2019 at a share price of around 20 ringgit. So that time, I already kept Kausberg in my watch list. I was like, okay, 20 ringgit. Uh, if it drops down to, let's say, um, 10% discount, uh, $18, 18 ringgit, I will buy it. Mm. But this share price just kept going up and going up. And when it goes to 24, I was like, okay, drop down to 22, I will buy it. So this so-called dilly-dallying uh, uh, and keep wanting to timing the market kind of approach actually made me lose an opportunity of a 50% uh, capital gain if I, will have, if, I, if I were to bought Carlsberg at 20 ringgit just one year ago from now. And as of today, it's at 30 ringgit. Uh, the share price has been up 50%. And if you have invested in Carlsberg just one year ago, you will be a very, very happy man today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I can feel your pain. Uh, although I, I'm i uh, trying to challenge your idea here, I actually is a shareholder of uh, Carlsberg Malaysia and also Heineken for quite some time, a few years now. Okay. Um, 
So uh, you are right, the, the share price actually rallied more close to 50% in 2019. So now if I ask you back now, right now, again, right, would you buy the stock right now? Yes, I would say definitely. I mean, <laughs> although, although, okay, okay, uh, if you compare the price to earnings now versus uh, one year back or trailing uh, PE ratio, uh, historically, the, for the past two to three years, Council has been trading at the, far, at the PE of around 25-ish. And uh, as of today, uh, the price of 30 ringgit per share, uh, it's roughly around 30, 30 times. So you're paying like five times more the PE. Um, of course, people will argue that five times more is a lot. But um, that's when you when, when we just look at uh, PE as itself only. But the thing about investing and after, uh, after uh, personally practicing investing myself is that when a good company like Houseberg and with such a fantastic business model, and you know that the company is going to continue growing, uh, growing uh, over the past, or over the future, up uh, five to ten years. Uh, it's very really inevitable that the price will have to, uh, uh, eventually tag, tag along with the company earnings. So if you are going to be a long-term value investor, uh, the price of 30 times PE with a, uh, for a company with, 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 su with such a solid business model doesn't really bother you. Uh, concurrent, but coming from the other side is that if you are a trader looking to profit at uh, price fluctuations, then you'll be very scared because uh, for a company trading at PE of 30 times and being such a company at trading at $30 and which where the price is quite high, you would not really be able to uh, capitalize on the potential capital gains if you were to hold it for one month or just two months. This is a company where you have to buy and hold it on, hold on to it to, for like at least five to 10 years to mm. really see uh, the magic that it will make to your portfolio. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's basically what Buffett says, right? Um, it's much better to pay a fa fair price for a great company than a great price for a mediocre company. Yes, and <laughs> that actually sums up. The, the... We all have to uh, experience this and learn this the hard way sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm thankful that uh, I really heard learn this the hard way and uh, hopefully uh, no more other good opportunities like big sitting mm -hmm. on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, that's great. But also, uh, when you talk about the valuation for Houseburg Brewery Malaysia, uh, when we check on Heineken Malaysia, it was, it is actually trading uh, at a lower valuation than Houseburg. So right now, it's trading roughly about 25 times uh, its PE. Uh, yeah. Although you say that, yeah, you feel that Houseburg has a higher growth potential or, uh, and, and uh, it, you are bet it's more diversified in terms of, of its business. Uh, when it comes to these two companies right now, when you put valuation into consideration as well, would Kalsberg still be the one that you choose over Heineken? Well, surprisingly, when you ask this question, I'm actually a Heineken shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you didn't miss out much. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I never missed out much. <laughs> la. But uh, I think I think Carlsberg, uh actually taught me the lesson. I kind of realized the mistake I was uh, actually committing uh, somewhere around uh, middle of last year. So at that time, Carlsberg is already uh, trading at a higher premium compared to Heineken. Mm. So based on the cheaper, slightly cheaper valuation of Heineken, I took position of... Uh, bit of position on Heineken and uh, well, I, I actually take along the uh, capital gains of Heineken second half of the year and not mm -hmm. to mention the, uh, the dividend yield that, uh, that uh, that's going to also add to my uh, so-called dividend payout. So mm -hmm. yeah, Houseburg actually taught me the lesson to not time the market and I realized that mistake I bought Heineken at a cheaper valuation. But if you talk about the growth potentials, uh, I think both companies are stand to uh, profit from the population growth of Malaysians, and uh, it would it would be very difficult to say that uh, Carlsberg will eventually be thrown 
or to take a uh, complete uh, complete market share of uh, Heineken Malaysia or vice versa. Uh, for the past 40, 50 years, Carlsberg and Heineken have been listed and have been running the business in Malaysia and they have been, although they're actually competitors, but uh, they can actually still share the whole market, share the whole piece of pie together with, with, with each other. So uh, both will eventually grow as uh, the human population rises. Lah. Yep. Okay, fascinating. I totally agree with you uh, on your idea. Although you are just uh, giving us a thesis of one company, you're actually giving us two ideas right here. Yeah. Uh, investing <laughs> ideas. <laughs> so thank you very much for your curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so thank you so much. And uh, for you guys who want to know more about uh, Junpan and uh, what, what he likes to write about, uh, of course, visit us at valueinvestasia.com. You can find many of his articles there. And also, uh, you can check out his blog at mykayaplus.com where he share more details uh, analysis about uh, mostly stocks in Malaysia and it's a fascinating read uh, on his blog do check it out thank you very much uh, Junpat for joining us I'll see you very soon thank you for listening you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcast Google Podcast Spotify or wherever you get your podcast if you are feeling generous please give us a rating and review as well this would greatly help other investors find out about our podcast to access our show notes, please go to valueinvestasia.com slash investing ideas and be sure to sign up for our email newsletter for more outstanding content and reports about investing. The show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as investment advice. Please seek professional advice or do your own research when making any investment decision.